And now we turn to Washington as the investigation into the January 6th insurrection continues. Details continue to emerge about efforts made by Donald Trump and his allies to overturn the election. Donald Trump, who used to support Vladimir Putin throughout his own presidency. Now, Mark Giglio is a journalist who's focusing on war, terrorism, and national security. In his latest piece for The Intercept, he profiled Stuart Rhodes, founder of the Oath Keepers, a U.S. military group that took part in that attack. Giglio joins Michelle Martin now to discuss who he is and what drives him. Thanks, Christian. Mike Giglio, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you for having me. Let's go back to January 6th. I think many people who saw what was unfolding will remember this kind of column of men, many of them seemingly dressed in what looked like tactical gear, heading up the steps of the, of the Capitol, they clearly seem to be in some sort of order. And it emerges that a lot of these folks were part of a group called the Oath Keepers. Now, this is a group that you've been following for years. How would you define this group and how did it start? So the Oath Keepers started in 2009, right after Barack Obama's election, when you saw a big rise in right-wing militant groups in America. And they are one of the largest, if not the largest, such groups in the country. And I think the number one thing that defines them is their focus on recruiting members of the police and military who are either still serving or, or retired. And what's their purpose? What's the goal? They say that they're there to defend against tyranny and to protect the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. What that has meant in practice, especially um, since Donald Trump became president, is participating as a force supporting Trump and the Republican Party. And that's what you saw on January 6th. You interviewed the founder of the Oath Keepers, Stuart Rhodes, more than a dozen times in the past couple of years. And again, I venture to say that until January 6th, and maybe even now, most people will have never heard that name. So tell me about him. What's, what's his story? Um, so he was raised by his mother, mainly. Um, she comes from a family of Mexican migrant laborers. Um, he joined the military right out of high school, hoping to join the Green Berets, Special Forces. Mm -hmm. Instead, he never deployed. Um, he was injured uh, during a training jump as a, um, when you trained to be a paratrooper. He was a really hardline libertarian, um, big, big Ron Paul supporter. And after he was injured in the military, when he was in his like mid to late twenties, he went back to school, started a community college, went to UNLV um, and graduated with honors there. And then ultimately uh, graduated from, from Yale Law School. And so he could have, this guy could have had a career as a you know, lawyer or you know, successful in politics, something like that with his educational background. But instead um, he went down a much darker path obviously. And after uh, Obama's election, he, he founded the Oath Keepers and his career has been as the leader and figurehead of the Oath Keepers ever since. You say they want to defend the Constitution. You know, I'm sorry, I can't help but notice that this, this, this deep concern about the Constitution seems to have coincided with the election of the first Black president of the United States. So you can't help but think that there is a kind of a deep strain of white supremacy involved here. What is the world that they see, that they feel that they're defending, agitating for or defending against? So... With Rose particularly, especially because of his libertarian background, he was a guy that in very obscure blogs and, and places where he was writing, you know, in the 2000s, someone that was writing about the Constitution, he was very alarmed by the war on terror. He criticized the Bush administration um, for the constitutional overreach. You know, that being said, there is no way that the Oath Keepers or any of these militant groups, they're not the only group that surged after Obama's election, there's no way that they would have existed in the numbers that they did if it weren't for Obama's election. And I, I think the best way to understand the group is, is through the Tea Party. They were embedded in the Tea Party wave. And so that was an entire reactionary wave to Obama's presidency. I think it's undeniable that race fueled a lot of that, um, but not all of it. And so they exist in that space, you know, where the Tea Party as, and, and, and was sort of welcoming or bringing uh, what we would normally consider the far right into the mainstream of Republican politics. And, and I think that that's really the trend that you need to, to track. 
if you want to understand the Oath Keepers. And just, you know, I think you're, you're raising a really important question just in general when they talk about the Constitution and they want to defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic. But I think it raises the question always of, well, who's defining the enemies? If you're, if you're doing this outside the structure of the police and military, who is defining who the enemy is? And obviously we saw like during the presidency of Donald Trump, they define the enemy as Black Lives Matter protesters, Antifa, they called them insurgents. They said that Trump should deploy troops to stop them. And so they were very much part of this culture war that I think has engulfed you know, a much larger segment of the right. But it doesn't seem as though they have any kind of coherent agenda, a coherent specific desire for how American society should be different other than that they're mad. I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a drive for power at this point. And I think a, 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 an overarching fear that their way of life, which they would not in conversation with me or anyone else define on race. And, you know, obviously when they're speaking, like they, they, they try to move away from that, but it's, it's more their, the conservative values as they define them. You know, and, and I, I really think like that is something that Trump fed consciously. <laughs> Like telling, you know, if you look, if you look at the speech with which Trump launched his reelection campaign, it's 100% geared toward this viewpoint. You are under threat. Your way of life, however you define it, is going to be taken away from you. Liberals are going to change every facet of the America you know and make it something different. I think the echoes of race in that are obvious, and I think so do you. Um, but they're not. That's not what they're talking about when they when they talk about this stuff. They, it's, it's painted as a much larger societal threat, and and that's why I think the the lie about the election is is so dangerous because the way that this is they, these are people that have believed again for years that there's a threat of tyranny and that that the country's on the cusp of going past this point of no return. Now they've been told that the election's stolen. Now they've been told that it perhaps has reached that point of no return. What is the recourse available to you if there's not elections? And these are groups that have defined themselves on the potential for political violence, you know, with being armed and, and being so adamant about the Second Amendment and saying that if necessary, if it comes to it, you know, that's how they, they'll couch it, we will fight. And now you're in the moment, you know, now you have Trump and the entire apparatus of the Republican Party in one way or another telling people that maybe this moment is here. So tell me about January 6th. What was their role? on January 6th? So according to prosecutors, the Oath Keepers had two columns of members, as you described, break into the Capitol with the other rioters. Um, so I, I think that they were, they're being portrayed at least by prosecutors as, as a, a major part of the breach of the Capitol, not the ringleaders of it, as far as prosecutors have said so far, but just part of it and an organized part of it. I think it's important, and, and I spent a lot of time on this in, in my recent article, to understand that they were seeing themselves as potentially having a much bigger role than that, and that they were, they were as Stuart Rose in particular was positioning the Oath Keepers as, waiting to respond to Trump's call to potentially take up arms. That, you know, they had stashed weapons in Virginia, and they, they were, you know, he, he had written these open letters saying, we are ready, if called upon, to act as an, an arms enforcer of, you know, for the president. And, you know, it seems like they thought that was a real possibility. Um, I haven't found any, anything to say why they thought that would be a possibility, but I think it's really telling that they, that they thought this could really happen and that they were ready to do that as they portrayed themselves. And that's, again, that's being an armed, an armed wing of, of, a, of a party, uh, you know, one part of the political spectrum and really one, one person. Um, if that had actually come true. So what happened afterwards? I mean, first of all, the former president had many days in which he, you know, pardoned his some, you know, former associates of his. He chose not to pardon any of them. He could have, but he didn't. Um, what, you know, what now? How many of them are in custody? In fact, Stuart Rhodes is in custody now, isn't he? Yeah, so he was arrested in January. Uh, and denied bail, and he's supposed to go on trial, I think, in July, or it could get pushed to this fall. And he's facing charges of seditious conspiracy, um, and that could be like at least two decades in prison. I, I spoke to him after January 6th uh, a few times, and I noted, you know, a sense of betrayal on his part, you know, feeling like Trump had, had left him out to dry. He, he, mentioned, he mentioned the pardons issue, saying, 
you know, he didn't even pardon us on, on his, on his way out of office. He could have, you know, and I, and I, I, I find it um, telling that Trump recently has been saying, if he gets reelected, he'll consider pardons for January 6th people. You know, he's, he's, I think he's hearing the, the, crit the critiques from this segment of the, of the right. And he's trying to respond to it. You know, the last time I spoke to, to Rhodes, last time I met with Rhodes was in, um, early January, like right on the eve of January 6th. I, I wanted to speak to him about the anniversary and his expectations. Um, and he was really adamant in complaining about not receiving support from Trump or from any big players in the Stop the Steal movement. It came out in a report uh, in BuzzFeed um, recently that after Rhodes was arrested, Sidney Powell stepped in with the money that she had raised and began funding his legal defense. Um, and I, I think that's a major you know, development, you know, as far as him actually now seeming to receive at least some support um, from, from the Stop, Stop the Steal uh, players. So just for the record, I need to note that Rhodes has pleaded not guilty to the charges of seditious conspiracy. His lawyers describe his actions on January 6th as not criminal, not extreme, and not serious. Uh, and they insist that there's no compelling or legal reason to continue to detain him. The fact that all the other at levels of government have do not adhere to this point of view that the election was stolen, has any of that penetrated his consciousness? I, I was really struck by the fact that he could feel so betrayed by Trump, which he, which he, he did, at least in my interviews with him, yet still so convinced that the election was stolen. That, 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 that idea, like this sort of movement of January 6th can even be independent of Trump. Mm -hmm. That, it, you know, they could just take on a life of its own. Um, and, you know, I, I say in the piece, like, something like this, like, whether you're Rhodes or whether, even whether you're Trump, like, to think that you can know where it's going or that you can, you can control and influence it, I, I think is, is, is really probably foolish. Well, to your point about how how these sympathies are sort of so deeply felt at the highest levels of our government, in fact, society. There's been news this week about the extensive conversations that the wife of one of the Supreme Court justices, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas's wife, Virginia or Ginny Thomas, um, the constant communication she was in with the chief of staff, former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, you made the point earlier that what is worrisome is that this is no longer a fringe, that there are sympathies to, of these groups at the highest levels of the Republican Party, and indeed because of that in the government. So what, what do you make of that? Yeah, it's, you know, I try to, I try to like use the case of like someone like Stuart Rhodes to, to tell this story of what has happened to the conservative movement writ large. So you take, take a guy like him, before Obama's election, would have been considered fringe, far right, you know, liber the libertarian, you know, Ron Paul movement, which never has any chance of power, right? He has watched his worldview and his mindset, which is, you know, the conspiratorial worldview, the idea of that, that of the, you know, a fight against tyranny being reinforced to him, and to anyone who thinks this way, by the power centers in, in the Republican Party, by senators, by, by the president, the wife of a Supreme Court justice. You know, what would that tell rank and file conservatives? You know, if, if this, is, this is what's being presented to them from the top down, these are views that have always been there but are, are, are becoming much more widespread. And it's, it's at this point being fueled from the top down. What Sidney Powell, if you, if you look at Sidney Powell's press conference where she announced her master theory of election fraud, it echoes so clearly with the theory of the new world order that militant type groups have always believed. She, she's 100% hitting all the notes of deep state conspiracies, foreign Marxists, collaborating with traitors in the United States, domestic enemies to take over America. You've reported extensively around the world. I mean, you've reported on 
on you you prefer the term militant groups other people would call them extremist groups i'm not maybe you want to tell me what you think the difference is but you've covered isis overseas you've covered you know militant movements all over the world do you see a relationship between or do you see similarities between the kinds of movements that you've reported on overseas and this group and others like it that you've reported on in the united states yeah so I, I had lived overseas as a war correspondent for, for six or seven years, and then was getting ready to move back to the United States in, in 2017, um, you know, around the last election. And I noticed people threatening civil war and all this really militant talk that did remind me of places that I'd covered where the social fabric is just completely decayed and people that are threatening violence and, and, and all the rest that is now kind of commonplace. But when I decided to, to you know, to at least consider covering these groups, I, I did sort of a thought experiment, which was what in my experience covering civil mm-hmm. wars and overseas w- could tell me whether to take these groups seriously or not. Cause I don't want to just give them oxygen if, if they're ultimately just don't, don't matter and are just kind of like a media show. And, and for me, you know, the number one thing that would make a militant group successful overseas is if they have sympathy in the military and law enforcement, in active members and also in veterans, because that gives you know-how and also gives you kind of a foothold in in the people who know how to fight and who, in any kind of real conflict situation who would be countering your group. And you know that was what put me onto the Oath Keepers. And you know I, I do think that it is really important to understand just the extent to which these groups are do have sympathy among law enforcement and military. You know, it's not as, as 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 widespread as they would like me to portray to, to say that they're this big, you know, ten-headed monster and we should all be cowering in fear over them. But I do think it points to a much larger problem in, in American society where you have you have a not insignificant portion of people with real military and law enforcement experience who are taking these groups seriously, who who see them ideologically as on the same wavelength, and also a much you know they have sympathy among the broader population. And those, I don't, you know, I don't think that we're not, we're going to have necessarily some sort of civil war situation in the United States, but I just think we are way too close to that. You know, we, we have way too many echoes of those situations and I think we should be comfortable with, and I think that we should raise an alarm over any step in that direction. And, th- and that's what I'm trying to spotlight in my coverage of militant groups in the United States. Mike Giglio, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you for having me.